Oh, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to episode 519 of Flow Wrestling Radio Live. I'm your host, Christian Piles. Joined, as always, with a nice little new backdrop. The funky but one, Ben I, Askren. It's coming along. You know. It's coming along. We're, we're not quite there yet. We made a lot of progress yesterday. So you see the TV mm-hmm. right behind me where I can put the logos up. Um, you know, I got my, my bookcases up in the office now because we had a re- we you know, made this office. Um, and we, we have a few adjustments to make, but uh, we are getting closer than uh, than we need to be to be finished. And to my right, Daniel Roy Lobdell Jr. Last show for him for the week because we're going to welcome Stephen Kyle Brackey back to the fold. Oh my I haven't goodness. seen him. Jeez, when a, I don't know. A month. It feels right? like like three weeks or four weeks. Yeah, yeah, it's it's been a while. So we'll be happy to have him back. He's either back or almost back to his yeah. home in Texas. So that's good. So yeah, <laughs> the big day today. Holy cow! Uh, so we're dropping. We are episode three. It's done. It's gonna be up on the site soon. Uh, but you can't watch it till this evening. So not. Uh, so don't get all excited. So we're excited for that. We should hopefully definitely have an announcement before we are episode three drops. An announcement? Uh, You guys didn't tell me about an announcement. Yeah. Yeah, well, loose lips sink ships, baby. Yeah, that's right. Why me? uh, I'll say this. We've added a match. I'll say that. And I'll say that and nothing else. And it's good. It's good. I hope hope it's what you uh, you guys were posting about yesterday. Um, no, maybe. That's, no. Were we posting about that match yesterday? Um, he knows. No, no, it's not about that. But it could be. Maybe that would come later. So we're not okay. done adding to the card. Uh, so awesome. we'll have that. That hopefully today. So very excited about that. And well, I'll say this: we're so excited about this one. As soon as it was signed, we got on the phone. We're like, "Hey, we should send someone there." So Mike and David Kuhn, <laughs> who were just last week with us. Wow. Gallivanting around the Northeast are going Saturday to this place. Undisclosed location. Undisclosed location. In the United States of America. Yes. So, very, uh, it's, uh, yeah, we're excited about this match. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> hmm. so, so they're not coming back? They are back. Okay. I yeah. Mike was still, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, my, Mike, Mike extends his trips. He does, you know, camps all over the place. So did he come back to Texas? No, but he was not on F- uh, Flow Official Business as of, like, Friday. <laughs> so, no Flow Official Business. Yes. Weekends. But he's on that Mike business because Mike stays stays working. Uh, yeah, I love it. So. Well, you know, Mike has a great opportunity this summer, Christian, because, you know, the, and, and I did not take advantage of this, uh, but the NCAA coaches – they literally can't coach anywhere at camps. And so the camp market is, uh, you know, it's, it's very unsaturated. There's there's a lot of need for good clinicians. And, you know, we did our camps here in Wisconsin, but I did, I did not travel anywhere to do camps. Yeah, I wish I was good at showing wrestling moves. It would be a nice little, nice fun <laughs> side hustle. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's – uh, Mike is – Mike is Mike keeps himself very busy. He's a very coveted clinician, which is, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that stinks because that is like a big uh, income generator for a lot of these coaches, right? Yeah. Like, you know, especially mm-hmm. you think of the assistant coaches, they don't they don't make as much. And it's a great yeah. way to, you know, you can probably make, I don't know, 10, 15 grand and if you do a couple couple clinics. I don't know what the going rate is, but. It's a good way for the kids to have a summer job. That too. Yeah. Yeah. That too. I mean, that was what I did every summer in college to make money was uh, go teach wrestling camps. And, well, I know yeah. that th- there are some college athletes that are doing that right now. Yeah. They're, they're able to uh, go do camps. I guess just oh, yeah, not specifically athletes, for their right. schools. Well, college athletes are, yeah, they are able to go to camps. Um, the coaches are not. And then obviously none of the colleges are doing camps because they can't. Right. Right. Yeah. So, hey, we said we were going to talk about this David Taylor interview. Did you watch it, Ben yeah. Askren? No, I was waiting for you to give me the the insight. Oh, you want the insight first? Why, why don't you watch it and bring Wait a the minute. Insight? Wait a minute. You're waiting for it. You tell me that was part of the Hold deal. Hold on. Ben, huh? are you saying like so you expected right CP to be Listen, your cliff notes? No, I trust Christian to give me good feedback, and uh, you know I go off that. You, so you're not going to watch it? Uh, I don't know. It depends on how excited you make me about it. I watched okay. the Kyle Dake one because you made me excited about that. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right, neat. 
So we'll talk about we'll talk about the interview, I guess. Oh, let's go. What he said. What? Tell me what he said. What did he say? You could have listened to the whole thing. Yeah. It's an hour long conversation. So we talked about. I, I didn't have an hour yesterday. Well, he does not respect what? Pat Downey as a person. Um, okay. You didn't have an hour. Now hold on. You, all you have to do is listen to it. You could have just had it on your phone and just listened along. I suppose I could have. You know, I was in this town meeting. Hey guys, we got a special use permit for the city of Franklin. To, uh, to build out our building there, which I'm pretty excited about. Dude, you know what my least favorite thing of all time is, Christian? Town meetings. I probably should have had my earphones in and listening to something because, oh, my goodness, these things are – they are a bear. Um, wow. Yeah. I don't have know what you, to say. Have you ever they're, watched they're the show Parks, Parks and Recreation? <laughs> uh, like one time maybe. But, I mean, I've probably been in – seven or eight different town meetings and they're relatively all similar they're it's, yeah they're 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 a piece of work well if if the meetings were anything like the parks and rec like public forum meetings where the, the all the people of the community come and yell about like uh completely ridiculous things you probably would have a different opinion but yeah i can imagine that's very why did you have to go to that just to get the permits or something you to get, yeah so you i mean in certain jurisdictions if you're if you're not zoned particular for that you have to get say what's called a special use permit we also had to get our site plan uh approved so you know there's a, there's a handful of things you have to do but yeah i mean so the, there was there was a citizen's comment period and it was really funny because three different people all came up and said we're really hoping you don't extend the emergency corona uh procedures that would do any imposition on people's business or people's liberty and that was all they said and it was like it was like two sentences, and you're like, "Wait, is there more? Like, you're gonna tell me about like how it's gonna hurt people's liberty, how it's gonna hurt people's businesses?" Nope, that was it. And then they went and sat back down. And I'm like, "Why? Why did they need to show up to say that? Like, what? What's going on here? This is so weird." They wanted their voice heard, Ben. And it was heard, but they if they if they got the damn microphone, say more than two sentences. All right. Well, what's what's the time least, limit there in uh, Manitowoc County? You get you got twenty seconds. Most give you at least a two minute public comment. Yeah, I, I don't. You know what? No, no one cut them off. So I'm assuming it was much longer than what they what they had said. But yeah, then the the issue that took the long time was that there was a three hundred sixty unit development they wanted in. Yeah, they're arguing back and forth, and you know whatever. We don't need to talk about it. You guys aren't, you don't want to hear about that. You want to hear about freaking David Taylor telling Pat down he's a bum. Let's yeah. go. He didn't tell him he was a bum. He didn't tell, but he does not respect him um, as a person. He said that. Understandable. He, uh, I, I did ask him this. I said, um, you know, the Penn State room. Then he corrected me. He said the Nittany Lion Wrestling Club room. Uh, I said, oh it had, my goodness. It had, I, I was like, I was like, it has Kale. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was funny. It's, it's got Kale, Varner, you, Snyder, Bo, all in there. And I said, is the the room ever been tougher and he's like no i don't think so and i said okay is there who is the king of the room is there is there a, a, a defined person that like this is the best guy in the room and i was like you don't have kale, to admit. right and he said it's still kale to this day Dang. It's, it's still kale how crazy is that that's pretty crazy i mean we, we talked about that when we talked about the michael jordan show but yeah i mean it's, it's totally crazy it's funny because you know I know he didn't train full for the 2011 Worlds, but Christian, we're a decade we're a decade later. David Taylor is the reigning world champion. Kyle Snyder is a world champion. Jake Varner was an Olympic champion after 2011, and the fact that Kale can beat them all still is like whoa. Yeah, I mean Kyle Snyder is, I mean how old? He's like 25 or something. Yeah, maybe mm -hmm. 25. He's an Olympic champion. Yeah, he's 25. Oh, he's 24. He'll be 25 this year. Yeah, not even 20. Not even 25 yet, and should be in the prime, and he's, you know, got to be a lot bigger. It just doesn't matter. It's just the answer is the answer is Kale until, I guess he's got to be 50, you know, 50, yeah. 48. At some point, it's it's going to happen. You know what's funny? You know what you, know what you got me excited for, Christian? Hmm. Last week, and I just started thinking about it, and I don't, I don't even need them to do a match. I just need to see, like, I want to see, like, a hard go. Like, these dudes slap hands, and they, they go at it. Kale and Jaden. I mean, that would just be like, oh my, oh my gosh. gosh. That would just be so much fun. I don't even need them to wrestle a match. I just need them to get, get down and practice, you know, like slap hands and, and try to kill each other. Like, that would just be so much fun. Yeah, and we talked about that uh, potential matchup, like who Kale would struggle with. And maybe, maybe would be Jaden. But, you know, if he's still beating David and Snyder, it's certainly a question. 
Um, but we you know, talked, but we, we said stylistically. I mean, yeah. st- stylistically, Jaden. I mean, what's so fun about that is Kale is this offensive dynamo, and and Jaden is this defensive wizard. You know, I mean, he, he has offense, right? But do you think defensively, how is Kale going to rack up points on him? It's, it is going to be so much fun to watch. And as we mentioned, we have seen him ankle pick, but we'll probably never see it. But it'll be awesome. Would that be <clears throat> so? From the perspective of like, Jaden is obviously training to beat Kyle. And Kale is obviously coaching Kyle to beat Jaden. Well, that's on the path of things that they want to do, but that's part of it. Yeah. Would yeah, of course would Jaden do it? Just because mm-hmm. it would also make him better. Yeah, maybe, maybe after twenty twenty one or so, maybe after twenty twenty one. Well, I mean, would Kale do it too? I, I think, think so. it would be far more likely Kale would because he there would be no downside for him. Uh, certainly yeah. not in a public setting, maybe. but maybe. Well, that's what I'm saying. This is yeah. a practice room match. This is what yeah. this is what Ben's talking about. Practice, practice room, room yes. match. Yeah. Well, we should do a public practice room match <laughs> where everyone can watch it. Dude, that would be so awesome. Officials and scoring in two periods, three minutes. <laughs> Cameras everywhere. Yeah. Commentators. Ah. You know, a practice match. <laughs> a match behind closed doors. <laughs> uh, but it's real. Seriously. So this Quentin Wright interview, man, you've got to listen to it. It came on the Bader oh. Show. It is. It is fascinating. And he talks, there's a lot of funny things, but just talking about the practice room stuff, he said the first couple of weeks he wrestled with Kale every day when, when Kale got there. And he said all he did was step on his feet and push him over. He never took a shot. All he did was step on his Kale feet did. and put, yes, <laughs> and push him over. And then he would get a takedown from, from that, and he would just hold him down for a, for a half, like, you know, he would not let him up. He's like, he was never mean, he never hurt me, but I could not get up. And... He's like, it was demoralizing, and he was like, all the while, he's like messing with you. And he would be like <laughs> holding him down, and he and like Quentin would be like maybe getting close to an escape or something, and Kale would go, stay, stay, while he's wrestling <laughs> with them. So, I mean, you imagine he's doing this to, you know, and he, he said it was because Quentin wasn't moving his feet enough, right? So yeah. it was really, it was funny insight, and then Quentin also talked about, um, they're, I guess they're sort of sports psychologist Bonnie and like how this impact that she had on him in terms of like, she's like all about energy and all that stuff. He's like, it sounds like crazy. He's like, but it works. It like, she helps you unwind the trauma that has happened in your life and helps you like focus your energy. So I don't, you know, he goes into it a little better than I can, but it's really, really, really interesting stuff. He also... For him, it seemed it was stuff like within his family, right, and like the the way he was kind of brought up to wrestle, and then going to Penn State and having different, I don't know, I guess would be expectations of you of what your practice is supposed to look like, which competition is supposed to look like, what wrestling is supposed to mean to you, and yeah. that's kind of what she unpacked for him, which doesn't sound very unique in terms of something that a lot of kids have to overcome when they go to college because their whoever their influencers were when they were kids yeah. kind of it got them to a certain point but it also messed them up a little bit yeah that that's a hard one man even i mean even if kids get to 10 with a parent 10, 10 or 12 and then you know i start seeing them and then obviously they still live with said parent right dude that it, that influence is hard to unwind and you know generally speaking i always say almost all parents there are some that are really terrible people, but almost all parents have the best interest of the child in mind. Just a lot of them don't realize the damage they're doing by certain certain actions. And so, yeah, I mean, that, that's really fascinating. Okay, Piles, there's no way I'm going to have two hours today. That, that's impossible. Um, I may have an hour. Should I watch Clinton Wright or should I watch David Taylor? You know what? Whatever, Come man. Come on, which one? Which one? Gun to my head. David Tell Taylor. David Taylor. Part. Okay, David Taylor. Um, Dang it. But you, you guys got me a little more excited about the Clinton Wright. Then you did the David Taylor. You know, you don't now, need now, to sit and stare into the eyes. Missing out. I'm sure you – listen, well, maybe we need to have you a, a should... time management course. I mean, I, okay, I run – we have five AWAs. We own two buildings. I'm building a disc golf course. I'm on this podcast. I mean, you, uh, you know, I run, I run 11 practices weekly. We're running camps. I mean, well, I just I know that you're time. very busy, but I'm sure you're driving a lot. Driving is a great I, opportunity. I actually don't now. I don't know that the corona hit. I go, my academy's three minutes away. Okay, so you don't drive there. Yeah. I don't you drive get there, a Pogo stick? Well, you probably I drive in three minutes. 
No, it's three minutes. I drive. Um, I, I will. Yeah. Okay. I'll watch David Taylor, and hopefully, maybe I'll get to Quentin somehow. But I gotta watch We Are today. Also, that, that's uh, that's gonna be what thirty minutes. Now, I'm, I'm most excited about that. That's gonna it's be like awesome. Thirty nine minutes. You got oh thirty nine minutes. Jesus. You guys Sorry, give buddy. me some good life, life advice today. So you just make media. You never consume any media anymore. No, I, I do. You know what? You know what my main tactic is. My my wife thinks I'm totally insane. Um, you know when I'm working out, which is not all that often anymore. Maybe thirty minutes here and there. Um, I, I will. I I listen to podcasts at double speed so I can get through twice as much. Double speed is is tough for my uh, my own uh, processor. Mm-hmm. Right, it's, it stresses it. I like to go somewhere between one and one and a half. Right, sounds like they just drank yeah. a lot of coffee. Um, two two X's. Because then I'm rewinding to find out. Wait, what did he just say? And you know, yeah. so no, I don't quite do that. But I, I like speeding up podcasts as well. Okay, so <laughs> Sam Herring, Sam Herring said, "Play on the speakers at wrestling practice." Good, number one, can you can you imagine how annoyed the kids would be if I was playing podcasts on on the speakers <laughs> at practice? And number two, I I think that would be both distracting to me because I would be trying to have attention in two places and possibly distracting the athletes if they wanted to hear what the podcast said. So Sam, while that is a novel idea. I don't know that that's going to be efficient. Yeah, perhaps But I appreciate it. Yesterday was recruiting day for me. I talked to a bunch of coaches, a bunch of parents of kids, and then I talked to Sam Herring for like 45 minutes about recruiting. Poor kid, he's in like seventh grade. He's already thinking about it. Well, it's called good problems. Okay, are we talking about David Taylor? Yeah. How do we get off topic? Well, you start I, talking about Quentin Wright. I'll I don't know. You. That, well, that was your fault. That, you, no, you, you brought up the Quentin Wright interview. No, I was talking yeah, about yeah, wrestling. You did. Talking about Quentin <laughs> no, practice was, room okay. stuff, and then y'all got it. And the next thing we know, we're in time management. I don't uh, even know how it you're happened. You're right. You're right. We started. You, you said the group of five. That was where we stopped. You said the group of five, and then we started talking about Jaden, and then I, somehow we got to Quentin. I'm not really sure. Yeah. So... David Taylor, very, <laughs> very interesting interview. Um, he's not happy with Pat Downey. Thinks what he's saying is ridiculous. We got into you know why he wanted that match, and basically, I mean, he talks about just how he's he's been able to get really, really good at at training to the point of exhaustion, and like then pushing through it. And that's like what is why his pace is so unique is that he's able to. Get himself every single practice. He kind of gets himself to that point, and then he get pushes beyond it, and that's why basically most people don't last six minutes with him. Well, and especially at that weight too, right? Like, yeah, the bigger you get, it is harder to keep that pace. Yeah, 190 pounds, and you're shooting. I mean, I bet if you took if you did like a statistical analysis, like offensive attacks per match, David's off the charts for a 190 pounder. Yeah, yep, that's a very good point. Um. So we, we talked about that. We talked about – I asked him about Casey Cunningham, who, like, is, like, reportedly, like, the strongest person who's ever lived. And he's, like <laughs> – he's, like, that guy is – he's, like, he's unbelievable. He's bas- – when when David was coming up and when he was winning Hodge trophies, like, Casey was beating him soundly, uh, it sounded like. And then, you know, he's, like, ba- basically he was world-class – a world-class wrestler who could have been competing and winning – uh, throughout, you know, David's I, careers. Dude, I'm going to push back on that. Casey Cunningham was in my bracket in 2008. He, he did not win the Open. He did not make the finals at the Open or the trials. So, you know, there there's something about being great in the practice room, but then, you know, also competing and winning. Casey, Casey, as good as he was, he did win an NCAA title, but he never, he never made a world team to my knowledge. And so, you know, that's kind of – I feel like that's kind of a stretch saying he could have competed at the world level – when he, he never actually, you know, he was close, but he never actually did it. And then saying he would do it after he wasn't already training. You know no, what I'm maybe, saying? Yeah, I mean, I, I understand that. But maybe he got a lot better since when he stopped competing. Is that not a possibility? I mean, I, I mean he, he was significantly older than me. Um, so, I mean, he had to be probably 30 in 08. Am I, am I wrong here? Well, you were yeah, the national yeah, champ. That sounds about right. Well, so the argument yeah. is that in 08, I don't believe he was with Kale yet, and he certainly didn't have the young hungry bucks think, like Ed Ruth and, and yeah. Dave Taylor to roll around with as frequently. I think he had just got to Iowa State maybe in 07. 
Dude, he's way old. He was the uh, NCAA champ in 99. So he was probably 31-ish in, in 08. Yeah, come on. How, who gets that much better after, you know? I mean, may, maybe in 09, 09, 09 and 10 were, you know, weaker weights. At, say, if, you, if you're going to say he's going to stay at 63, it was a weaker weight. But then we can say he's going to beat JB. Come on, that ain't happening. Okay. Well, Take I mean, what are you, you going to – do what? you want to argue uh, – do you, do you, want, you want me to say that Casey Cunningham's world class? Because I haven't seen him wrestle like hardly ever, right? I don't know. I'm just telling you what David Taylor was saying. And what? Well, I'm trying to have a debate he, about what David Taylor said. All right. Well, I don't know if he could go and win win world. Certainly, Casey's never made that claim, right? But yeah. listen, that room, 65 up, has yeah. been ridiculous, and a lot of that is because of Casey's influence. And he is a main training partner for a lot of these guys. He was David Taylor's main training partner. and I don't refute any of that. Okay. And he was able to beat <laughs> David Taylor and a lot of these guys. And just because, and I, you know, David Taylor was on the level internationally 2013. Now, could he beat Jordan Burroughs? No, but no one was yeah. really beating Jordan at that point in time. Literally no one. Literally no one. Yeah. And, I mean, he's still, you know, I mean, he was the guy – <clears throat> and, you know, they had to figure it out, right, because it was kind of oh. in between things. I don't think it's the Billy's been canceled at this point. But anyway, I mean, Casey was the guy with him at Pan Am's. Casey's guy that frequently goes with David to a lot of these things. So that that relationship has continued. And, yeah, Ben, whether you want to argue it or not, the impact Casey had it has is undeniable. Yeah. Well, I'm not, so, I'm, guys, here, here's I'm not arguing anything about his impact or how good of a coach he is because it's pretty obvious that he's very good and he's very valuable to those people. The only thing I pushed back on was the fact that, you know, he was world level or could make world teams. And it's just like, well, man, I don't think he, I don't, David never said he would make a world team. He's not like, oh, he'd, okay. he never said he'd make the world team. He's just like, this is okay. he's world class wrestler, right? Sure. Okay. So don't, don't try to, it's not, I'm not trying to make this some um, sort of indictment. Being contrary. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Um, no, I'm not. I, I, listen, I know. Listen. listen. I'm, I'm, paraphrasing, guys, I'm paraphrasing an interview for you that you won't listen to, <laughs> and then you're just going to get down there and microanalyze a word choice I used that I don't even know if David Taylor used. So it's like it's a it's pointless. Why are you twisting David's words? I'm not. I'm doing <laughs> okay, the best I can. Hold on, Christian. Here's why. I told you like that. I was I would always get really really annoyed, and this, maybe this is being my wife does get really annoyed because I'm very very specific. Uh, might have mild Asperger's. We don't, we don't know, but I'm very, very specific about things. And I would always get really annoyed when the UFC would call um, Matt Hamill world-class because he wasn't actually world-class. So for me, world-class is reserved for guys who go to world championships in place, right? I mean, that that's what world-class is reserved for, reserved for for me. So if, unless you go, go actually do that, I have a hard time saying that you are. Now, could Casey Cunningham probably compete with some of those guys? Sure. But did he ever make a world team? And the answer to that's no. Okay. Can, um, and again, I, I think he – go ahead, no man. So do you consider yourself not world-class then? I have a hard time considering myself world-class. I mean, I've beaten – I've beaten a handful of guys who were bronze medals. I beat a couple of silver medals, but I took – I took seventh, but I got bumped to sixth uh, because of steroids. Uh, the one year I did go to the world championships. But, yeah, I would have a hard time calling myself world-class. I don't think I ever use those terms when I talk about myself wrestling-wise. I might say – I was, you know, if someone asked me, I would say I was an NCAA champion. I might say I was an Olympian, but I don't think I would use the terms world class because I did, I didn't place when I got there, and that's kind of in my mind. And again, listen, I maybe I have slight Asperger's or something, and I have issues with the specificity of what we're terming things. But I have a hard time calling people who don't go place at worlds world class. Okay, that's fair enough. Yeah, yeah. All right, uh, we talked a lot about injury, injury recovery. <laughs> Uh, with David, he wants to wrestle Sad Jalayev. He would love to test himself against someone that great. It, it was interesting to contrast that the <clears throat> the way you talk about the injuries there, and he got very emotional when he talked about it at Pan Am's after he qualified the weight, because I mean he'd faced injuries before, but nothing like that. He'd never been off the mat for mm -hmm. basically a year. Right, and he, like he got very emotional in that interview, and, and and David's obviously very like when you get him going, right? He'll 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 talk for a while. Um, so it was just very interesting hearing him kind of be able to sit down, and this is what four months removed, three months removed from that, 
versus in the moment, first competition back, qualifying the weight, and um, just like, oh my God, this was such a struggle for me and you know something that I had to overcome at a later point in my career, all that stuff. Yeah, it was it was interesting because we we talked about that process of him coming back and you know for him to be back on the mat in ten months and qualifying the weight and he said he had some major he I don't know if he used the word setbacks um, well as my words get uh, microanalyzed <laughs> here um, but Sorry, it, did, it wasn't going as quick as he wanted it to and there were points in time where he was frustrated with his recovery and how well it wasn't going. And so he did kind of struggle with some doubts, uh, but you know, for him to be back and able, and he said he wrestled a way he never wrestled before at Pan Am's, just a very controlled style, very, you know, he kept the match kind of condensed it and made it wasn't the wide open thing. He just like, I know if I'm in these positions, I won't lose. So I'll just win this time. And it was kind of one of the few times in his entire career where he hasn't gone out with the the goal of I'm just gonna wrestle as hard as I can to score as many points as I can is like no it's very simple just win the matches and he says that now mm-hmm. he feels like he can wrestle his style fully and he has no limitations whatsoever whereas that wasn't the case at Pan Am's. Did you watch the match with Tori Blanca? Mm-hmm. Do you mem- I don't know if you could tell on the stream. Do you remember how angry he looked afterwards? And he beat him like either eight zero or eight one. And that dude use has given him really close matches before. Yeah, they had a criteria match one time. Yeah, yeah. So he, I mean, but do you remember that facial expression? No. I and I, I don't want to put words in David's mouth, but after listening to that interview and kind of thinking back to that, it was it was his own frustration with himself. Like, could I have opened up more? All these things, which would sounds like based on this interview, um, even though he won eight, I think it was eight one or eight zero, and dominated the guy. It was like, man, I didn't leave everything that I could on the mat. So it's good to hear that he's now back to a place where he feels he can go all out. Yeah, we talked about the move up in weight class, and uh, you know, did he ever have doubts he would be fu- uh, fully functional, able to wrestle his style at eighty six kilograms, and. You know, he had some reservations. He, he kind of like, not reservations, he regretted his approach to moving up um, in 86 where initially he was like, I'll just get as big as I can. And he got like immediately up to 203. And he said he just felt terrible. Instead of just like naturally just letting himself get bigger, he just tried to get big right away. And he said that had a big impact. And he said that, that Kyle Dake kind of, did a similar thing initially, and then he eventually wrestled just at his weight, whatever he weighed. And then he was, you know, what did he weigh in at, at Worlds? He was what, 77 kilograms for mm-hmm. yeah. 86 kilograms, and he still was a foot away from making the team against a guy that got bronze. So uh, I guess advice to guys that are planning on moving up in weight class, don't mm-hmm. just try to get huge. Just let yourself get bigger more naturally. That seems to be the – Lessons from David Taylor and Kyle Dake, who are both world champions. So listen to them. Uh, okay. We, we talk, Oh, one of the things I was most interested to talk to David about is, so we talk so much about burnout, youth wrestling, being good right away. And David in so many ways breaks the mold because, because mm-hmm. he's literally been at the, basically the pinnacle of what he was doing since elementary school. Mm-hmm. Elementary school, he was the best. Middle school, he was the best. High school, he was the best. College, he was the best. Now he's winning the worlds. And he's always done it with, you know, seeming, seemingly a, a joyful spirit about wrestling and competition and not burning out. And, you know, he had a dad that, that pushed him. And he had, you know, co- coaches that were, you know, harder on him and probably were that coach right Mm -hmm. and yet he you know he says he burned he there were two different times he did burn out but he didn't burn out in the way that you know name a name a wrestler burned out what times one was eighth grade going into freshman year or or Mm -hmm. somewhere around that time yeah when uh he just he hadn't hit puberty and he was like ninety some pounds and he was losing to guys he yeah. was better than, yeah, because he just hadn't his body hadn't changed the way theirs had. Basically. <laughs> that's a hard that's a hard one in middle school. That's you so hard. 
But it's also like it's probably really tough to get a eighth grader to understand it. But it's also like it is yeah. the most pointless thing to worry about too. It's like these. Yeah. It's like this is a puberty loss, <laughs> son. Yeah, Make, you you see that this kid has I muscles that, and you but, don't. But but them getting their butts kicked, they don't right. They didn't say I'm getting my butt kicked. That's no fun for them. I mean that's dude that that's a huge one. And puberty is. Uh, I think Tommy Rowans on our old podcast most famous said puberty is a PED. <laughs> it is, dude. It is so much. And the kids that hit it late, like like literally, they'll go from being you know a state champ to having a hard time going to state because. You know, especially like bigger kids in middle school, seventh, eighth graders, which are bigger, but who have not gone through that yet. Dude, that that's a beast. So he, he's right on that one. Yeah, a um, 140 pound kid that's hit puberty versus a 140 pound kid that hasn't. That is Dude. like that's like a completely different beings. It's one thing when it's like 80 pounders yes. and 80 pounders, right? But yeah, like, well, no, 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 80 pounder in eighth grade hit puberty. <laughs> well, yeah, good point. <laughs> there may be some. There's anomalies for everything. <laughs> Uh, um, but yeah, so that, I mean, I well, think. Wait, that, what was the other one? Uh, I, I I don't remember the. Other, I think it was um. Wasn't in elementary school. I think it was like a a, a college or a, after. I think maybe 2013 or 2014, he was so beat yeah, up yeah, from sense. from cutting weight and, you know, not making teams. That maps. Uh, yeah, I think maps. I think it was then. Perfect. So yeah, I with, would say. Go ahead, man. Uh, I was just going to say with the, the, the youth thing, I just push back on that all the time because the the amount of guys who are tremendous, who had success, like, you know, as five years old at Tulsa, um, I understand that burnout is bad, and it's it, but I just think some kids just, they just take to the sport, and they love it, and they will overcome all of those things. Um, like, Kerry Colat, right? I don't recommend yeah. that every dad treat their kid like Kerry Colat, but... He was able to take it, but could Kerry but knowing have knowing been Kerry what, if your kid without, can take without, it is the hard mind. part. But but no man, could Kerry Collette have been Kerry Collette with what we should probably classify as child abuse? Yes, yes, he could have. There's probably a good chance, right? So it's, is that necessary? And so it's like, do these kids do these kids achieve this uh, because of this or despite this? Right? Wh- which one is it? And a lot of times, I think it's because despite the parenting style, the kid still overcomes and achieves. And then on, on the top of that. You know, I've had this argument with a lot of people. It's like you don't need to be good early to be good late. That is, that is not a prerequisite. Obviously, mm-hmm. sometimes, like you said, are certain kids more combative? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, there's some kids who are naturally combative. Obviously, now again, like Ozzy, I've been, I've been roughing him up, you know, give him a little collar tie since he's been one year old. So he's probably going to be a little more combative, which a lot, you know, a lot of some dads grab their kids a little rough with them. Some kids are like, oh, uh, sitting on the couch. So, yes, some kids are more combative. Some kids will take more naturally to wrestling. But the other thing we have to factor into this is, are those styles of coaching slash parenting, are they prohibitive of, and I hate, I hate using this term, but growing the base of wrestling, right? Like, the, we, we talk about this. Like, there's, USA Wrestling Statistics, only 59% of people who wrestle, wrestle again the next year. That's effing insane. Yeah, there's, there's a big reason why we can't grow the numbers of our youth and high school sport. Well, because 41% of them quit every year. 41%. Yeah. Think about that. It's You're insane. just on a so, treadmill. And, and yeah, I think the, the so thing coaches, with that, Ben. Coaches, yeah, okay. go ahead. Okay, coach, coaches that coach in that manner tend to have a lot of kids that burn out, and they blame the kids. And, yeah, those kids weren't tough enough for you, for you but you're, you're kind of a uh, – I'm going to say a naughty word, so I'll just stop. Go. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Ben. The uh, the uh, the thing with that, with the forty one percent, and I think this is the hard part, and something that you've probably thought about more deeply than a lot of people, and you know, probably somebody like David now is probably thinking about with his club, is okay. There's forty one percent. What is the range of kids who are like they're just going to quit? Like they just their parents yeah. may try wrestling, they're going to quit no matter what, whether they had success, whether it was easy, whether it's hard, no matter what. What is the that middle ground, that gray area percentage of, is it 5% of those kids? Is it 10% of those kids? Is it 50% of those kids that would come back if things were done a little bit differently? You know, if maybe yeah. another friend of theirs had joined, if another friend of theirs had stayed on. Um, I think that's the hard part to identify. Yeah. But, and I'm curious the, now to hear David's thoughts on that with his club, which has a ton of kids involved. 
Yeah, I, I can tell you, our, our retention is, so 40, 41 minus 100 is 59. Our retention is insanely over 59%. I mean, we're I'm talking probably 85 to 90-ish, obviously. You would say, well, the kids who are coming to our club are probably already more serious about wrestling. And sure, that is true. But even with our little ninjas class, which is a generally beginners, it's, it's higher than 59% significantly. Um, and so what I would say is the year, year over year statistics, so, it's 41% in one year. So if you start multiplying 59% time, times 59%, well, the next year we're at like 35%. So two years later, you're at 35% of the original 100 kids. Another year later, you're in the 20s somewhere, right? So over the course of years, so even if you go from, say, you know, we'll, say we'll just round up to 60. But if you go from 60 to 70, that's a big difference, right? So if you if you keep another 10%, that that's especially now you, you accumulate that over the course of, five to 10 years, it's a huge number. So and things we can do to mitigate kids quitting or kids burning out is gigantic for wrestling because, you know, we, we kind of talked about this yesterday, but things don't grow unless they have an economy around them. When they have an economy around them and people can actually put money into them, that's when things will really, really, really grow. I mean, we've seen this with full wrestling. Full wrestling has put more money into wrestling than anybody, period, right? And because of that, the coverage has grown to exponential levels from what it was in 2000, say 10, 11, 12. It has grown like this. And so, again, if you could do that with kids, if you keep more kids around, there's an economy around, the, a bigger economy around the sport, the sport will grow faster. And so, yeah, I mean, all, all especially all these idiots that use that grow wrestling hashtag should think about that when they're when they're coaching the kids. So one thing I, I'm, I'm curious about is where does competition lie in this? Because – I think if you look at almost any sport, any little league sport that any kid does, so there's practice and there's games, right? And I feel like competition is something that should be in, in my. This is my personal parenting slash coaching opinion mm-hmm. is that is that they you should be slow to enter your kids into wrestling competition, right? And Agreed. I know that. I sent Caleb to uh, a club for a while, and they were they were like, "Hey, Caleb, Caleb's ready. Caleb's ready to compete. He could do it. He would yeah. he would he would be all right." And I'm like, "No, he's not." And like maybe he would, and he probably would beat some matches because he's gonna be stronger than a lot of the kids, and he knows some things. But yeah. it's he's not he doesn't know the rule. He's not really ready. And even though yeah. he's he wants to, I think if I asked him, "Hey, you want inter tournament this week?" He'd probably do it. But um. I just know that he he's not right, and I know that would yeah, no, be the best I, experience for him. Yeah, you, you're you're totally spot on on that. And I, you know, I can just I could cite a bunch because my, my daughter still has not competed in a match. I told her next year when she's eight, she's going to wrestle in one tournament, right? But most yeah. people say, "Oh my God, she wrestles she wrestles zero matches at five, six, seven year old." She, you know, she wrestles at our our little like, our little ninjas class, um, but that's it, no matches. She'll do one tournament next year, and um, and, and that's really it because I don't really see the purpose. And you know, I just. I brought up this kid because sometimes I got to remind kids how much better they're getting. But we have one kid right now who like I said, I think he's probably going to get ranked hopefully by you guys as a junior. I won't say his name. I don't want to influence you. He won a high school state title this year. It, 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 he was one of the guys who really took to our philosophy of starting late. I mean, I want to say, guys, he didn't do more than 15 matches a year until eighth grade. I mean, I would be shocked. That's just my feeling. I would be shocked if it was, maybe it's 20, but it's the, the answer is it's not a lot. It's not a hard like some of these kids are doing. Um, and then obviously as a freshman, he started competing a lot and boom, boom, he's went like this. Right. And, you know, so, he, but he was one of the kids where I was kind of, I want them to be a little more prepared by ninth grade. So now we've had our seventh, eighth graders who have been with us for a while. We're encouraging them to wrestle like 40, at least 40 matches a year. So they get more competition. So we have kind of ramped up our seventh, eighth graders, but our, our stuff with the young kids stays the same. We don't need them to wrestle. They don't all listen to us, but we encourage them to not compete a lot. Yeah. I think there's like, so. Ben, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. There's like three prongs on to me on the competition at a young age thing. So number one, there is like understanding the value of wins and losses and like it's good to win, it's okay to lose, and it's just like part of the process and kind of – will the kid be able to handle success or failure? Like will they be able to handle it either way? I think that's part of it. Yeah. Which is yeah. which is part of what Christian was talking about with with Caleb. Like, okay, like if he wins some matches, if he loses some matches, how is he going to handle it? Um, I also think it's like treating competition as 
this is like what Dave was talking about. Treating competition as joy, right? Like, oh, I get to show off all the yeah. cool stuff I learned in practice, right? And, and treating it as yeah. as a privilege, right? As as something you're grateful for. Uh-huh. And then the third thing is, and I think this is, I I think this is the big thing because I'm not terribly against little kids wrestling. Again, if they're like if they can, you got to read the room if they can mentally handle it. But you only have so many weigh-ins in your body. And oh, I don't know about that one. <laughs> Really, you don't think there's like a like for each person there's like a finite number where it's just like, because I, I mean well, Johnny Hendricks is the one that comes to mind for me. Like I'm I, never cutting weight again. Here. Yeah, yeah, it may, it might be here. Also, what weight classes are you choosing? Are you choosing stupid weight classes that are really hard for you to cut to, yeah. or that's are you going we up the weight? But that's what I'm talking about, none, right? Like, yeah. like, sure, that's fair. Allowing allowing kid just allowing someone to to wrestle and make it about wrestling, not about cutting weight. And I'm still okay with kids cutting a little bit of weight. It's just. You only have a finite amount of times where you're going to put your body through that hell. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess, I guess men- mentally, just that that would just encourage that burnout faster because I don't care who you are, cutting weight is a terrible thing. No, nobody enjoys it. No one says I'm looking forward to, you know, losing this last seven pounds of sweat. There's nobody <laughs> on the world that says that, right? Um, and they might do it for a purpose, but they would not just do it for pleasure. No one does that. So, yeah, I would agree with that. And, you know, again, we don't really have our little kids cut weight. I think it's kind of counterintuitive. You know, maybe for Fargo, when they get that age, which but by that age, they're kind of older, right? We'll maybe encourage them to make the right weight classes. But then again, during the high school season, uh, unless there's a log jam on their team, we're encouraging them not to cut a lot of weight because you got to weigh in 20 times. Fargo's two weigh-ins, right? The first day, the second day. A high school season is 20 weigh-ins. That's a significantly different thing on your body. And so, yeah, again, I guess there's a competitive log jam on the team. We're encouraging kids not not to cut weight at all. Yeah, mm. Makes sense. Yeah. All right, so that was and, – and, and I asked how he was applying that to uh, – you know what what he's learned along the way to his school m2 uh training center and he didn't want he didn't want to get very specific there which is very penn state of it's him. kale kale-esque i know <laughs> i was like really little league wrestling but all right fine um and he's got good help there with mark know, mcknight and, yeah mark and eric so yeah it was it was funny he talks about how like the first practice they had like six kids showed up they're like this is going to be an epic fail <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, that's, uh, that'll happen. I mean, the first summer there was a handful of days where there was only two kids in our room right in the middle of summer because people just weren't used to wrestling in the middle of the summer. Yeah. And, uh, well, we don't, we don't have that problem anymore. Yeah, I guess not. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. Have we recapped enough of the David Taylor interview? Um, yeah, you know what? I guess I'm, let me just kind of finish that thought up. It's like, and the other thing about David Taylor and, and some of these other guys is, you know, there's a lot of times that I think parents see maybe a really good parent, you know, kind of the way they act, and they try to replicate it. And some of these parents that are super hardcore actually have, like, and maybe it's right, maybe it's by accident, maybe it's first, but they have like a decent understanding of sports psychology, and they like, they're they're interweaving their their really aggressive side with with a loving side as well, and it can kind of balance itself. A little bit and then there's other parents that try to replicate that and if you have that like hard ass side without the loving side they, there's nothing to balance it right and it just makes the kid either hate you or hate wrestling one of the two which both, both are bad right so there are some parents who kind of you know again i don't know if it's by accident or by design but they haven't figured it out and then parents try to replicate that and it just doesn't work yeah and it, it's interesting here you know quentin talks about his upbringing and you if I know you wrestle Quentin. I don't know if you know him at all, Ben, but he is a really, really nice guy. His dad He's was super hardcore. Nice, heard, yeah. His dad was yeah. hardcore. He was that dad, right? And yeah, you know Quentin. Dude, uh, Quentin talks about how at one point he was kicked out of his own house because he was spending too much time with his girlfriend. And then he's like, he's like, I felt like I had no one because after he lost to Gambrel, the entire Penn State. He said they were all mad at him, weren't talking to him. He was kicked out of his house. He's like, it was just my mom and my grandma or something like that. Wait, he lived at home during college? He was from State College. I don't know yeah. if that's what that means. Oh, I um, thought he was from Bald Eagle area. Is that is that by State College or something? Yes. 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 Very close. Okay. All right. Mm-hmm. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. So wow. he, he t- tells that story, which I thought was um, fascinating as well. So there's, there's a bunch of, that – that he gets into, I think people will find. Yeah. Quinn's another one, weight like you talk about Penn State weight wise. 
74 to 97. 160 is a junior in high school. 71 is a senior in high school. 74. Then he won his title at 84. Won his last title at 97. Yeah. You know what? Um, the crazy thing he talks about when, because remember he was Sunderland era initially, right? Yes. And he, mm-hmm. Mark Perry was his coach, and that was his guy. And he talks about how he and Molinero were, like, the only two that really bought into Perry's system. He's like, everyone else – he said everyone else was lazy, and then Bubba Jenkins would just do his own thing. Um, mm-hmm. And and then he talks about how the Kale thing came to be. And he's like Perry, – Mark Perry's like, you'll never believe who they're looking at. Kale Sanderson. And he says and, – and so – Mark basically knew the writing on the wall. Apparently, was <laughs> he would not be around after that. He's like, y'all better get <laughs> ha- have your fun now, because once he because there's not gonna be any party and not gonna be any of this, not gonna be any of that. And Quentin's like, and that was true. He's like, but we had fun in a different way. But then he talks about how wait, Quentin was a partier prior to that because that see, doesn't Quentin does not strike me as no a party way. dude. No way, I don't think so. Uh, but I think maybe he was speaking on behalf of I don't know if he was the team or what. Yeah, I think maybe he's speaking on behalf of the. So is Kale as hardcore as Pat Pop? I don't oh, know. No. There's zero percent chance. There's the, documented people that drink and weren't kicked off party. the team. Yeah. Hmm. One of them won okay. three titles. Fair um Right? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't talk about that one in the film. Oh um, good one. Thanks. So Yeah, probably not. Um, definitely not. But I think it, he is um, – he's very serious about it. So yeah. – but no, what I was going to say, we kind of talk in, in the film, I guess it's episode one, like how there was no rumor mill about Kale to Penn State. It was just boom, P- Kale's the coach. And another thing that didn't make the film that we, but we talked about, at least I talked about, it, was like it was going to be Rob Cole, right? And I'd never seen that written. Penn State? Yeah. Oh, I don't remember that. That's so long Quentin, ago. Wow. And then Quentin talks about that, but that was like uh, that wasn't like published or anything. That was just kind of the thing. Like Rob was yeah. going to be the the next head coach, and then Kale entered the fold, and then it was Kale, right? Oh, because makes... Rob actually grew up in State College too, didn't he? His dad was the coach. Oh, uh, yeah, his dad was the coach. Wow. So, right, sweet old Bill was the was coach. I think, I think you're right. Yeah, I think you're right. Yes. Wow. Yes. So. Which what makes it? There's a couple of things that are interesting. One, 2011, it was Cornell versus Penn State for the title. Mm-hmm. Quentin says that, um, you know, we shouldn't have won that year. He's like, he says something about Andrew Long, and then he says something like Cornell should have won that year. They kind of, he basically says they, he didn't say they choked, but something like similar, like they underperformed and we res- we wrestled great. He said it in a very Quentin Wright nice way. Yeah, very, very nice <laughs> joke. But what was the most interesting part about the KO coming to Penn State thing, he's like, they flew they flew him in at night. But after everyone was, no one was on campus, he did the campus tour interview and he flew out before the morning just to keep it. Really? Everything. Yes. To keep everything wow. like off the grid to prevent the rumor, because you know, if you think about for for Kale, if it had got out, dude, Kale Sanderson's looking at at Penn State, and he doesn't go there, and he's still at Iowa State. It, that would have been a That'd thing, be weird, right? Yeah, it'd be a real thing right now. I don't even know if you could do that right now. Like right now, if if let's say everything got pushed back to 2020, and Kale wanted to do this, I don't think there's any way it wouldn't have got out that that. Killed. But if anyone could have kept it under is, the radar, it's probably him. Yeah, 2009. Yeah, it would be hard to keep it under the radar, man. That would his be really first, hard. His first, it would have been 2009. Social media. Yeah, yeah but Twitter was level. barely not, a thing. You know, not really YouTube, a thing. YouTube's yeah. in its infancy, right? Yeah. Full, everything. Yeah. So it's it's all it's a message board sport at that point, and now it's you know something completely different. Yeah, yeah. So, so that I thought that was oh. interesting. I mean, a very candid uh, Quentin Wright, and he goes on to talk about like there's the fundamentals of wrestling, and then there's Kale's fundamentals. Mm-hmm. And if you can learn Kale's fundamentals, and he wouldn't tell us what those were, but if you can learn Kale's fundamentals, you can be a champion. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna be a wait, Ben Askren. What, what are the Kale? What are the, he wouldn't tell. He us. wouldn't wait. tell us. He wouldn't tell us. But Ben, hold on. I, I want to push back on this. We need to hide a secret camera in their room already. <laughs> I was there last week. 
I want to push Not back on this because if you ask a lot of guys, the, the highest level guys, right, a lot of them will say, I bought into my coach. I fully believed in what they were saying. Mm-hmm. So I don't necessarily – and I don't know. Maybe Penn State guys will get mad at me. I don't necessarily know that it's Kale Fundamentals. I'm not trying to downgrade the Kale. I mean, he's 189, right? This, this, it's not a debate. But I think it is. I think one of the Kale Fundamentals is just buy-in. Like, I think he gets his highest-level guys oh, yeah. to buy-in at a greater rate than anyone else. I think that is the difference as opposed to the, the Kale Fundamentals, yeah. which I'm sure are also great, and I'm sure Kale is also tremendous as a coach. That is inarguable. However, I don't necessarily fully buy that it's like so radically different as opposed to just he is better mm. at getting them to believe what his what his thing is. And that's why they have three guys who are multiple time national champs as opposed to one guy who's a multiple time national champ. Man, I don't know. I think I know what I mean though. I, I know what you mean, but I don't I don't agree. There is something. Well, I think it's both. So I think I think nomads they do right buy in, and yeah. the fact that they do buy in more frequently. Um, but I, I think it's probably a, co- a compounding thing. Like you have this good thing and this good thing, and the, the two good things together make a really really good thing, right? Sure. I mean, I, from a technical standpoint, um, there's no one who there's not a team that you would say wrestles through positions just across the board as well as they do. Um, and if you want to call it scrambling, fine. But this their comfort level with. Um, awkward positions is on another level compared to most teams. And this is, you know, talk through Mark Hall all the way back to Quentin Wright, right? Over, over the course of their, their existence, that's kind of, kind of the case. I mean, though, the one thing that makes me a little bit say from a technical standpoint, you're right. is like, I always like, I'm mind blown sometimes by how bad the backups are like that. That one kind of like uh, makes me think like they, they get guys yesterday. They get guys to levels uh, that we've almost never seen before on a more regular basis, and then they got backups who are freaking terrible. Like, well, I guess maybe they just spend their time with ten or eleven guys. I, I don't, I don't know. Okay, I'm but like, Ben, I'm like that, that one perplexes me. I hear you, and there are some programs that like, like Lehigh has very little drop off from like first through third. Like that's really incredible. Yeah. Oklahoma State seems to be able to slot in backups pretty well. Yeah. I understand what you're saying there. However, generally speaking, in most sports, when you lose an All American, the replacement is not an All American. And I know that you're not talking yeah, about but, an All American replacing an All American, but still, I'm so, just saying a guy who could get in there and win some matches. I mean, like think about some of the guys they've slotted in as as, as backups or when there's a serious injury as a long time starter. They're like really bad. They're not like average. I'm not saying all American. They're not average. They're not national. They're like bad, like really bad. Ben, I could give you a lot. They've had a ton of really good backups. Yeah, like I they got a lot of really bad ones too. Yeah, I but mean that's but that's just sports and wrestling, man. Like okay. that's just hard to. Perez Perez started a lot for of matches for for <laughs> Iowa. Okay, uh-huh. it ha- listen. After Metcalf, 149 was a wasteland until, like, Sorensen, I think. Right? Like, I mean, it happens. Um, it's happening. Oak. Sure. So, I mean, you think just some of the, the backups they've had. You know, Nick Nevels was on the bench. They've had uh, Kassar was on the bench a lot. Yeah, Shakur sure. Rashid was on the bench. Gino Morelli. James English was third string. Zach Bites. Volrath. Yeah. Volrath, who beat Daringer, never started. Uh, Jordan Conaway didn't start every year. So, yeah. And there's a bunch I'm I'm forgetting as well, so I don't I don't know, man. They've had some really really good backups, but you're I mean, they have they have thrown some guys out there. You're like, oh man. So I, <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like they just found this dude in, in philosophy class. <laughs> like he hasn't been in the wrestling room. <laughs> yeah, well, but I do definitely think the the, the thing that has because like so. Kale recruits very well, right? Unquestionably. Yeah. A lot of coaches also recruit very well. But if you look at, you know, the the rate of bust versus success for call it top fifteen, top twenty guys, Penn State obviously does that at a higher rate. And I yeah. think a lot of that has to do with with the buy in and and the trust that that Kale develops with these kids, which is clearly incredible. Um and so I think what 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 impresses me about Kale and the, the the coaching staff there is, they have had high level guys that haven't done well, or they have had high level guys that haven't mm-hmm. reached their potential, but they still win in spite of that because they have these other guys who, 
either get to that level yeah. or, or exceed. And I think that's why the, the, yeah. the buy-in that they get is fascinating. Yeah. Brandon Scannell, Scan Man. I saw, I saw want to know what the, I saw want to know what the, the, Chris, I'm so mad at you that you weren't like, you know, when they started talking about the kale fundamentals, you should have, you should have like strapped this man down and like, did some uh, okay, well, water, I, water drip this, torture or something this like up. that. Oh, I, <laughs> is there, hold on. Back up significantly. I didn't do this interview. It was Mark Bader. So take it up with Mark Bader. <laughs> you should have tortured him. They asked, okay, two, in what scenario does Mark Bader, myself, or a combination of us end up in a position where we can even torture Quentin Wright, who is larger? Okay, I got and, this. I got this. I got this. Ready? So you remember the movie Ace Ventura when he sneaks up behind the guy and he puts like the – the stump over his nose, and the guy passes out. Okay, you go to the state college. You do that. Boom, over the mouth. Quentin Wright passes out. You tie it. Boom. You tie his arms to the chair, and then and then you torture him till he gives us the kale fundamentals. Wow. You know what? what do you we'll think? just leave that one to you. <laughs> is that legal? Uh, no. At no point is any of that legal. <clears throat> Even if you're in pursuit of the truth. So I was going to read something, um, in from the Facebook <clears throat> comments. Uh, Brandon Scannell said, I had a former PSU wrestler tell me this March that said, you leave one Kale Sanderson practice and you realize everything I thought I knew about wrestling before this was backwards. Yes. That's pretty interesting. I love it. I love it. So every, so we need to start working backwards. Reverse engineer. I love reverse engineering. You're reverse I'm all, engineer I'm all for that. what I think I know about wrestling. I mean, to yeah. Ben's point about the, the technical stuff, though, one thing that's really fun is going to like scuffle and just watching them use scuffle as like a lab. Right? Just mm-hmm. the way like Nolf will be doing they're like, what the hell is Nolf doing? He's just trying. He's just trying stuff. Right? Yeah. Or Mark will be like, eh, what if I what if I go this way with the arm? They're just trying stuff in live matches, which I don't know that yeah. other people are doing. Now obviously you have to be a certain level to be comfortable enough to try stuff, but I don't know that a lot of people are doing that in live matches. Yeah, I agree. To the same degree they are. All right. But, and that's and that, that, a coaching staff saying, hey, listen, bro, we don't care if you make a mistake. Just go try some stuff. I mean, and that's a mentality and that's a way of life that's really beneficial to having long-term success, although you might fail a little more in the interim. That is hugely beneficial to, to long-term. I mean, like that's one of the most dangerous things. If we go back to youth wrestling, like one of the things I'll just – if I hear parents say it, um, I will take the parents' side and say, hey, man, like, stop talking like that. that that's going to be really harmful over the long term is, is don't make any mistakes, right? Like, yeah. or be careful. Like, I don't want the kids to be careful. I don't want them to make mistakes. I want them to go out there and be a freaking savage. That's what I want. <laughs> Just tell them that. Slap them and say, go be a savage, right? That's, and listen, if we do that long enough, we're going to be freaking savages. There you go. Yes. Drop them. The the Amazon with a spear when they're seven and come back when they're ten. Yeah, yeah. Put your money where your mouth is, Ben. You really want to yes, take I, AMA I, I will. to the next level. <laughs> they're not going to wrestling moves when there's no man, and someone might die, so I might be held liable. It's not good. You can oh, teach man. wrestling. You can't. You can't. Maybe you can't teach savage. Yeah, but yeah, the whole uh, the whole don't make mistakes or that that philosophy. Ooh, thumbs down. I mean, may, maybe at the NCAA tournament. But, you know, again, you get guys thinking that way. They're stuck with that. It's stuck in their head. They can't get they can't get out of their own body. And they're so worried about making mistakes that they can't function at a high level because they're worried about making mistakes. So some parents brainwash their kids with that or that they have to do a move perfect. Like stop brainwashing kids. That, that is very harmful to their long-term development. Yeah, I had a great conversation about that at uh, the second Tulsa camp that I went to uh, with, with Coach Cordero. And – you know, one of the one of the dads there talking about one of these kids, right? Vin, Vinny Kilkerry, this kid who just throws the kitchen sink at everybody. He's like, he tried to score a takedown, score back points, and get a pin all in one move. And so when he was a kid, right, he'd let some matches go because he'd be up four and he would be, still be wrestling with ten seconds left, and he'd try some crazy stuff and he'd and he'd lose. And you know, there was always like back and forth between between all the, the coaches and, and and everybody. Go, we yeah, we got to clean him up. And it's like, hey, just let him do his thing because when he's when he's uh, an adult and when he's in high school and college and he's fearless like that, it's going to be yes. great. And that kid won a state title this year because of that. Yeah. I mean, you guys awesome. would say, you guys both know wrestling, right? 
Probably how high, if you if you could say, you know, and, and maybe obviously this is, I'm kind of putting you on the spot and you should think a little more about this. But if you could say, I can tell you, you have a, you can have a kid who's just completely and utterly fearless. Like how high are you going to put that on your characteristics chart of the kid? Because for me, that that's really high. I want a kid who is completely and utterly fearless when he steps on the mat. Yeah, I it's you would put it really high. Really high. So I, I you just see I just see because how much of of coaching conversation comes down to. Putting that belief in that you have yeah. what it takes, right? And that's yeah. that's a lot of it. Yeah. That fearlessness is is also belief, right? This will work. Yes. I think yeah, this will yeah, work. Yeah. I'll give it a shot. And you spend a lot of time just like unpacking that, getting them to a point where it's like, hey, man, if you go, it's going to be fine. And even if it doesn't work, it's going to be fine too, right? Yeah. So I think um, that's why you, you – uh, you should always say one, not two, when the guy is on top. It's just great, great for the mindset. I would put it second. Wow. <laughs> oh, okay. Like this. All right. I, I don't know. Why I, thought, I don't know why I thought you said you. I don't know why I thought nobody was responding to the one, not two comment. Um, no, I put it second. I behind. think I would say love of the sport because I just that's going. And and I I think it's probably because I spend so much time like looking at recruiting things. Right? Yeah. And I just watch kids and I go, that kid just loves it so much. And I don't know what his ceiling is, but his floor is much higher because he wants to be good. He wants to be in the practice room. He enjoys the sport. He just, he'll, he gets done and he just stays and watches, not because, you know, maybe he should be other doing other things. He just, he just loves wrestling. He's like, oh, that's cool. There's more wrestling here. I want to watch it. You you know what could kill kids love the sport, no man? Hmm. Uh, any number of things <laughs> no being being worried about being perfect like that oh that yeah 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 it's so mentally harmful or being worried about losing matches like not being fearless being fearful of making mistakes being fearful of losing matches being fearful of mm-hmm. you know uh retribution from coaches or parents because of losses right that that i mean that in of itself that'll eat kids up in in their head yeah i mean that they're intertwined right like but yes absolutely i think i guess i would if we were saying chicken and egg I think love of yeah. the sport helps fearlessness. Sure. Yep. I don't think there's and much you do word, f- word, fearlessly that you probably don't love, right? Yeah. Anything you do with yeah. like real freedom. Mm-hmm. Okay. Freedom. We need a holistic freedom, conversation maybe. today, gentlemen. Wow. Deep. It's a, it's a real tear wow. jerker. Okay. Um, do you want to go? Do we want to go? We go I'm, a couple. I'm different pumped ways. to watch F3. I'm pumped to watch episode three tonight. Yeah, man. You should be. It's gonna be a good one. If you actually watch it. Or, yeah, if you watch it, we'll see if you. Watch I will. It. Once I get home from practice, I'll get home from practice about nine twenty. I will take a shower, eat some food, and I will turn on episode three. Okay, you could even eat while you watch it if you want. Just a, just a quick. Uh, if possible. Yeah, I don't usually like watching uh, on my laptop at the counter, but you know, uh, maybe we'll see. Okay, I was thinking, you know, throw it on the your your Apple TV or something. I don't have an Apple TV. I, have, I got a junky TV, and it's got these lines running through it because freaking Ozzy hit it with a tennis racket. What a dummy! Ben, <laughs> a tennis racket? Ben, get a TV. Yeah. Yep. I don't know where the man found a tennis racket, and then his idiot yeah, he goes into racket? my barn. He goes into my barn and turns the lights on in the mower. He's on my mower's dead like three times a week because the freaking door goes on the mower and it starts pushing all these buttons. Golly, man. problems of problems of a two year old. Yeah, yeah. Well, get get a get a nice Apple TV. They're like seventy dollars, Ben. Really? Are they legit seventy dollars? I don't. I think I made that up, but I think it's also that's Apple. like one sixty seventh of a Bitcoin. <laughs> okay, they're one hundred fifty dollars. No, so I made that up. But and Apple TV is only one hundred fifty bucks for real. Because my wife has been complaining, and I'm like, listen, I don't ever watch that TV, so I don't care. Like, why do we need a TV? Let's spend our money on something we actually care about or something we actually enjoy. Well, it would be it would probably improve your viewing experiences of watching live wrestling. Do you yeah. watch all live wrestling on a laptop? Most people watch watch on, yeah, pretty on the much. app. Really? Yeah. <laughs> you should get the you should Really? Get it. Well, that's surprising. For how much you watch, it'd be a kind of a kind of well, on my fo- I watch a lot on my phone because, you know, like I'm uh right. say I'm at a tournament and I have a little break, I'll flip on a match or two, right? I'm at practice, there's a mm-hmm. tournament break before the next practice. 
I'll flip out a couple matches, stuff like that. Hey, remember that Vietnamese person kept putting up all the Big Ten matches? Hun Nouveau awesome. or whatever? Yeah. It was ACC stuff, too. Yeah. yeah. He probably got shut down. Good. <laughs> Don't pirate matches, kids. Stop being pirate. You just oh, steal from people. Wait. This, that doesn't help Christian. the sport in any way. Yeah. Someone told me that an Apple TV is not actually a TV. No, I need a new, I need a new TV, Christian. Yeah, I know you can get the. They sell those is, too. Is, Apple TV, is it like this? Is this like a, an no. Apple TV? It's like, like a box. Thing? It's like a. Okay, what well, was it? This thing upstairs. This thing, doesn't know what Apple this TV thing, is. This thing upstairs, Christian, right here. This thing. Ozzy hit one of these with a tennis racket, and now his lines <laughs> running vertically on it because Ozzy hit it with the tennis racket. Yeah, I know what TVs was, look like. <laughs> was it? Was it? Was he practicing his forehand, or was he like bashing it? I wasn't there, but he really likes bashing things, so I'm probably guessing that was it. He loves hammering things and hitting things. He's very destructive. So I you're don't telling have any me where he got that from? Yeah, I can't imagine that Neanderthal Ben Askren, who who brags about his Neanderthal <laughs> blood, yeah, may have a Neanderthalic child. Yeah, he loves hammering things. It's so funny. So listen, he's obsessed with my my full size chainsaw. And he always goes and tries to start it, but obviously not strong enough, and doesn't know how to do it. So I bought him this chainsaw and he sleeps with it now. It's, oh, it's hilarious. Oh my gosh, that's cute. <laughs> yeah, AJ Greaves in the Facebook chat says 250 for a good TV. I think you could swing it. Well, apparently, I, yeah, I, I guess, I don't up. know. I, I thought they were like a couple thousand bucks and I'm like, dude, that's a waste of money. I don't need it. It's just got a couple lines in it. It's fine. I know. All right. All right. Yeah, you could get a really nice TV for not that much All anymore. Right. I'll go to BestBuy.com because there's one like 50, uh, 500 feet away from my house. You look, Oh, wow. You live that near Best Buy. Yeah, I, I, I picture you more out in the, in the country. Well, I have, it's fantastic. I have 11 acres, but it is very – I mean, we are literally half a mile from Home Depot, half a mile from Best Buy. Target's a mile away. Yeah, it's fantastic. Oh, wow. Askren Acres. That's, you yep. you got to love it. Okay. Let's go to questions, I think. Cues from Fs. All right. I gotta pee really bad. I don't know if I'm gonna make it till. Next Come on, time. we'll see. Do it for. Uh, what's the coach? <laughs> Wait, Wayne Boffman. Boffman. Yeah, Coach Boffman. Do it for Coach Boffman. <laughs> he's yeah, he's not peed. All right, how many packs a day do you think Mus- Musakayev smokes a day? From Chris Foley. Seven. Do you think Musakayev smokes? Man, is smoking a popular thing in Russia? I think it is, isn't it? it has to be. How could it not be? <laughs> how could it not be? It's got to be just like the coolest thing. I heard hmm. a possibly apocryphal story about Sergey Small. And I think it was Kendall that lost to him at the Olympics or Worlds or something. I guess it was Olympics. And I guess he'd like, you know, really dedicate himself. And, you know, was like, oh, I'm not going to like smoke or drink. And then Sergey beat him and went back in the locker room and lit up a cigarette and was like, you want one? Oh, my God. <laughs> that would be awesome. devastating. You know, um,. What was I thinking? Um, I can't remember now. Never mind. Some of smoking. Oh yeah, yeah, I know. Have, like, have um, you ever smoked a cigarette, Christian Piles? Have, no, absolutely not. Okay. Um, have you? No, Matt. I guarantee. No, I have not. No, Matt has. Yeah. He's guilty. I can tell. <laughs> I'm yes. Not denying it. <laughs> Talk. <laughs> you smoked, No, Matt. No, I've never. Kicking you off the NC State team. I've never. I've never had a, a tobacco. I have never – I will say this. Oh, boy. I oh. don't – I have never injected heroin. <laughs> I, I have never injected heroin. I will never inject heroin. Um, I can't That's fathom no the addictiveness of nicotine because I – when I was like 18, mm-hmm. I had a friend that smoked, and so I just smoked because I was hanging around and was just like, meh. Like, they could just stop at any time. So yeah. I don't quite know how people get addicted. Well, it, some people. It, it, it really, like. People's bodies are different. I know. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So I, like, I, 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 I can't fathom what it does to their bodies to make them do it because I never got that addictive sensation. I don't know what um, upbring, upbringing or what about my upbringing made it so that I just have never even considered or felt tempted to have a cigarette but i would like to replicate that with my children and just with substances in general so i, I think a, a large portion of it is, is is my my parents but also yeah. i was watching i was watching angels in the outfield with my son caleb 
And the one Tony, the the character that Tony Danza plays, they reveal the angel reveals that he's going to die. The next year, this is going to be his last game. He tells the kid that sees the angel, he's like, he's going to die next year because he's been smoking. Oh. So now I saw that. I was like, I wonder if that's why. Because I love that movie. <laughs> it came out when I was like nine. Did I watch that? I was like, I'm not smoking. And because when I was Ever. nine, I wanted to be a Major League Baseball player. Didn't happen. Huh. You wanted to be Cal Ripken. I would be Cal Ripken. Well, see, I was realistic about it. I knew I wasn't good enough to play shortstop, so I was like, I'll play second base, right? <laughs> so I was making those concessions. Anyways, so I, I've always wondered, like, why have I just never even, like, thought about it? Uh, cigarettes are so gross, Christian. Uh, they I do smell know. terrible, but, um, you know, and now as I've gotten older, I'm like, geez, I'm so glad I never did because, you know, I know a lot of really strong people that – can't quit smoking. They can't stop, even though they really, really, really want to. So it's like, man, yeah. never gonna do that. So you didn't think this was gonna turn never into gonna a, do that again. This is never gonna. You didn't think this would be a dare, a dare episode. But that um, brings me to my next point. All right. Don't. The only thing I've known we ever ingested that is uh, uh, was not. It, it wasn't illegal. I, I lost a bet. Did I tell you this before? If I told this, just stop me and we'll move on. Well, I know you ate an a- edible accidentally. No, that was so. That was accidental. Knowingly. I bet someone on a disc golf hole, um, and I thought I was 100% to win that I would take a dip of tobacco. Um, that person actually is, uh, I believe, they're a college. Yeah, they are a college wrestling coach. There's a couple college wrestling coaches in that group of disc golfers, and, uh, and uh, that were there. And um, I lost. I couldn't believe it. Dude, I took a dip of tobacco. That was like, dude, I, I literally. Were you spinning? I played one more. I played one more hole. I laid on the concrete, and my head spun for like two hours. And then I got up and I went home. It was the worst thing. My disc golf was ruined. I I played. I literally played one more hole. I just laid down. I laid they must down have been cracking sidewalk. up. I said, "I'm done." Guys, go. They left me. It was fine. In two hours, I felt better. And I, I went home. It was it was so awful. I would never ever do it again. Oh I've never gosh. done that. Yeah. Yeah. It's terrible. Dipping. Dipping. Don't stuff. do it. Yeah. Don't do it. So dumb. Uh, Crab Ride 1, would Etchemendia be a good replacement for Pletcher? He would be, but he won't be the replacement for – for actually the replacement yeah. for Ashnault. Um, Wait, well, he is yeah. actually, oh, he is really really the replacement the lineup. for – Oh, okay, okay. That's how I read it. Well, I don't know. I read yeah. it as – The match. Yeah. He won't be the – he won't wrestle Luke Pletcher, but uh, will he be a good replacement? I think so. I think he's going to do awesome. Now, will he be the one seed? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, no. I think Etchemendia will be very good. Yeah. How about, oh, Yanni interview. Have you listened to this yet, Ben? Probably not. Um, you're at the town hall meetings. But he he's basically like, yeah, I think I know what weight I'm going, but I can't say. And it'll depend on a couple things. And I learned Josh and. Saunders sounds like he's wrestling this year. Did you know that? Ooh. No, that was, I said dude. that from Jump Street. No, that was not well, known from Saunders Jump Street. That's been a back then. and forth thing. 40, well, well, he, could it be 33? No. He's going 41 or 33. Well, then Yanni's going 49 because Josh Saunders is not going 49. Hold on. I, I, maybe it wasn't known, but if you look at all of my Cornell article, anytime I've talked about Cornell, I've said Josh Saunders would be the starter. It would be Saunders or Yanni, 41-49 in some order. And I said Saunders will be 41, Yanni will be 49. That was my prediction yeah. in like March. Okay. Good guess. Yep, there it is. Okay, so Saunders, that would be interesting. You have Vito at 33, though. He will not be. Uh, he's going to go 25. Yes, well, that <laughs> that was became apparent at the Oklahoma camp. And I was like, oh, you're like 127 pounds right now. Yeah. Vito's just – he's just skinny. He's just skinny. He just never – I think w- – we think he's bigger because he wanted to go 33 because he wanted to cut, like, zero weight. Right. Like, no, you will have to cut some weight. So he had to cut some. <laughs> I mean, Vogar was a 48-kilo guy. Yeah. But and Vito is rangy. He's tall. Yeah. So, yeah, it'll be 41 or 49, depending. I, t- To me, it sounds like 49. Uh, not necessarily just based on the interview, but if it's Saunders, yeah, they're going to be good. The other thing I didn't know yeah. when I did that lineup look – is that Greg D would be gray shirting, mm-hmm. which mm, now with Greg D gray shirting, it makes more sense with Greg shirting. <laughs> Greg shirting. He's gonna be a Greg shirt freshman. It makes more sense with with Vito staying uh, down. And Lajoy was cutting a lot, evidently, so it will be he'll welcome 133 pounds. How about Chaz Tucker has another year and is like, nah, 
We could win a chip at Cornell. And he's like, nah, Wait, but no, I no, want no, to coach. He can't, we talked about this. He can't yeah, wrestle he can't. for Cornell. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. Grass. No, he no hold on. He could. No, he, he can't. Could. He can't. He can't. I, I was talking to someone that definitely knows. And they're All like, right. he could have done something Isn't with this. Cool? No, but basically. Um, he could have done something with a um, with his academics and shifted it around so he had done something in the spring of next year or something. There's a way he could have wrestled for Cornell next year. That's Look, all I'll say. I think I think it's insane when fans are like, oh, yeah, just gray shirt, red shirt, Olympic red shirt, being college for seven years. Some kids don't want to be in college for six, seven years. Yeah, that's absurd. Well, okay. And compete and – yeah, yeah, I think he's just ready to be done. Yeah, but, man. Imagine yeah. if they imagine sub out uh, Chaz for the joy. I hear you. And look, yeah, Chaz would definitely help the team, but that dude's gonna make a boatload of money. That dude's brilliant. Well, he, I think he's he's looking for a coaching job. I'm saying, so he, don't worry, he's gonna be he'll make his money. Okay. I think he wants to go grad school and be paid to do that. Yeah, so well. he wants to continue to go to be, go to school, be a student. So anyway, yeah. he would have helped their team a lot. Uh, okay, we were doing questions at some point. Um, next one. Anything on NCAA athletes attempting to get their year back? Is Caleb waiting for COVID to blow over to take legal action? Um, Caleb is assembling his legal team. I haven't heard anything other than... I heard one team filed a lawsuit. Oh, which team? A uh, team with a potential four-timer. Hmm. Well, they oh. all are. Anyone with a freshman has a potential four timer. But I'll say Cornell. Uh no. Oh, Spencer the condenser. Okay. That's awesome. Wow. Dang. No. Thanks for sharing. I have no idea how effective it is. But look, I mean, look, if you're I don't think they're gonna get it back. Oh yeah, Yanni didn't even lose a year. But Lucky Yanni. If I'm Tom Brands, I'm absolutely t- taking every possible action. To try to get Spencer a year back. Yes, definitely. Whether how likely it is or not, you make that you make that effort. Caleb, dead serious. We were watching We Are episode three, and like I was <laughs> normally, he gets kind of this squirrely look on his face, like he knows he's being sort of ridiculous, and he's like, "Could I FaceTime the person that decided we can't that they don't get another year?" It's like Vincenzo was talking, and he you know thinking about that him not wrestling, and he's like. Could I FaceTime with the person? Like he wants to like have a, a stern conversation with this person. So he's 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 considered legal means now. He just wants a, a sit down with the person. He's he's fired up about it. Um, this is a good one from Sam Herring. Who are some wrestlers that you think are crucial? Oh, crucial. Geez, this is kind of for young athletes to watch that they might not be as exposed to as current competitors. Me, for example. So yeah, Sam wants to know who he should watch uh, a lot of. So we're talking about older guys then, obviously. Older, he yeah, I uh, he texted me about this, and I was like, well, what kind of age? What have you watched? And he's like, basically twelve on. I feel like I've watched a lot of the stuff, so maybe twelve prior. Right? Well, it's, it's 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 hard to find a lot of video on those type of people. Yeah, that's probably. The I think there's I mean, a decent chunk of like oh seven to eleven that's on flow that you could find. Someone who has a lot of matches that you could watch that I was one of my favorite wrestlers was Mac Lunas. I thought he was really mm. fun to watch, and he was good at a lot of different things. So you could watch a lot of Mac Lunas and find a lot of different techniques and things he was really good at. Yeah, that's the homie. Um, I mean, I, I don't want to be mean uh, or say but there's there's very few wrestlers, and I'll say John Smith is one that, that transcend time. Because wrestling as a sport evolves, right? And so a lot of even the better guys, what they were doing in 2005 isn't really highly relevant today. It's just not, right? Um, say like a down block go go behind in its current incarnation wasn't a thing 10 years ago. And so it's like if you're watching do a regular down block to a headlock and then try to go behind like that, to me, that's ancient technique. Like that didn't really exist till five years ago. And there's a whole bunch of those things. I mean, scrambling it has evolved so much in the, in the last decade. If you're watching... You know, I think some of the things that I was doing maybe carry over time, but a lot of things I was doing probably aren't all that useful, or maybe they're like a starting point. And then what guys are doing today is a lot more relevant to wrestling today. Yeah. Um, yep. I see, who is well? How about we just give them entertaining guys to watch? Um, John Smith. Yeah. Well, it kind of plays into okay. another question that 
blew your ass. Well, hold on. We have a special correspondent that wanted to ask if they if he should watch film. I don't know if we can pull that up real quick here. Here's an answer for oh, yeah. for Sam Herring. Go ahead. <laughs> Do you watch a lot of film? Do you watch a lot of wrestling outside of your own matches? No, bro. No. <laughs> <laughs> Why doesn't someone – can someone make a meme of that and, and, you know, put the big bold letters that says nah, bro, and it's him shaking his head? Can you do that for me? I would so use that on Twitter. I have the nah, bro, on my, on my nah, desktop bro. just waiting for someone to say something I disagree with vehemently on Twitter. Can you send it to me so I can use it also, no, man? No. Well, you <laughs> yeah, make it yourself, Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Nah, bro. Nah, bro. Nah, yeah, bro. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll provide for you. Bro. That, is, that, is, that is so rude. <laughs> He's rude. Hey, look, when when you did something that was really cool and somebody asked you, did you just do it for them or did you show them the way to do it? Wow. Ben, ah, ben wants to ah. think. Give a man a fish, feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish, feed him forever. Teach a man to fish, you just lost a client. Darn. A man knows where to get fish. All right, FRL listener, this is interesting. Any idea when Richard Figueroa will commit? Well, he committed on this show not so long man, ago. But don't worry about it. Oh wow! Oh, we're not. Don't 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 stress what I'm wearing. Remember that tweet? Yeah, but I don't know. No, I don't. I don't get it. I don't get it. It ain't. It's. I don't think it's gonna happen soon. If he changes his commitment. Well, that would be the answer to his question. So don't tell him. Don't worry about it. Uh, Pick one. Would you rather NCAA's be in Boston or Milwaukee? Well, I know Ben's answer. Uh, but I think it's probably my answer. Boston's all tight. And I've never been to Boston, so I would like yes, to go to it's Boston. It's really tight. It's tight. It's like New York tight, but even angrier people. Where would it be? Would it be at the Bucks <laughs> Arena? Yeah, dude, well, he's got a new arena. The Bucks got a new arena last year. How close is that Lambo. to a series of breweries? All right, it's Milwaukee. Um, it, it's, yeah, it's pretty well downtown. I mean, I would say there would be uh, – I would venture to guess that there's enough capacity within walking distance where people would not have to drive to – Restaurants and hotels. I, Milwaukee. I can't say that 100 percent certain, but I think so. Well, I'm certain that's that's also true in Boston. Um, if that's yeah. if that's your main criteria, no matter. Well, no, no, he was oh, he was just asking. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it is important to be able to drive. Remember when it was in Philly and it was like in the and there was like nothing around it. That was that was ridiculous. Have I, I told the story about where we stayed that year in Philadelphia on radio before? Like wasn't whether, a red roof in. Wasn't a red roof in. I, listen, this was pretty froze, so you were a fan. A red roof in would have been uh, the Hilton compared <laughs> to this place. All right, this place was so. So we wanted to stay. So we had gone to St. Louis and CAs. It was great. You could kind of walk. You didn't need a car for anything. You could either take the train or walk around, and it was no problem. So we wanted to be at a place where we wouldn't have to drive around Philly a bunch. And as you mentioned, Ben, there's nothing near this place but we found a hotel yeah. that was like a mile away we're like no problem we can walk it and it happened to be <laughs> happened to be highly inexpensive as well which is very great news so me and my brother and uh, a wrestler you know we go and it is it is mm, it is not the worst hotel i've stayed in but it is, it is oh, wait you're not at flow you're not flow at this point no it's 2011 this is, this is just by yourself yeah w- w- with my brother and an athlete, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. So I'm just on my own, and yeah, we're. It, this place was so terrible. They ran out of towels. They did not have towels for us, right? They did not have blankets. Stop. I swear, we're. At, they were like, no, don't towels. Don't towels. I call down. I asked for a towel. They, hey, we don't have any towels. Well, okay, we'll bring one up. Hour later, no one's come. I call again. The guy comes to my room. This is all we got. He gave me a bath mat. <laughs> he gave me a bath mat. Okay, so this place was all. Well, Wait, Christian. Was there other wrestling fans staying here with you, or was it just crackheads? Dude, it was not just crackheads. There were a lot of wrestlers there. This was I was on an elevator. Of course, Joe Russell doesn't know who I am at this point, but I was like, I was on an elevator with Joe Russell, so either he was staying there or some Minnesota people were staying there at the time. This is when he was at Minnesota. I was like, oh, my gosh, they're staying here? Jeez. Um, but here's wow. how you know this place is so terrible. Okay. Towel thing didn't do it for you. There's a, there's an additional thing. Well, I, I you know I can't paint a picture, but so well. But if you watch, it's always sunny in Philadelphia. Okay, Max Dad is a uh, felon who just gets out of prison. Okay, <laughs> and he's staying in a hotel, and the B-roll establishing shot. 
I swear, was a video, a picture of this hotel we were staying at. <laughs> <laughs> and it, because it had a very, very unique shape, and it's the exact kind of oh, place God. you would stay at. So anyway, yeah. we were wa- we would walk to and from the arena every every night. And one time we were walking wow. past, and we were going by like a restaurant, and we walk by, and this dude is just stabbing these tires of a car, and he I looks that person. No, thankfully, um, but it's very symbolic. He stabbed holes in these tires. And they look up, and they see, like, my brother and the wrestler, and he looks up, and he's like, I don't know if he biked away or did something. He just got, ran away. And they go in, and they're like, hey, uh, someone just stabbed your tires completely. This place. So that's, like, kind of the wow. area. Where it was not it was not a nice place. But um, anyway. Murder Hotel in Cleveland was kind of bad. Murder Hotel in Cleveland was worse than this place for different reasons. Um, yeah, I remember seeing you guys. I, I, I don't remember. I think we were staying down the street from the Murder Hotel in Cleveland. I think that's what it was when you guys were at that. It was the Biker Cleveland. Hotel. That was Cleveland, correct? The Biker Hotel was Akron. Um, oh, no. Was the Murder Hotel. You guys there and shaking my head like, what are oh. they doing at that hotel? <laughs> Surely Flo can afford one that's like $10 a night more or something. <laughs> I had to walk home to the Murder Hotel, too, <laughs> last night. Yeah, dude. That was a rough go. Only the strong survive. <laughs> that was a rough go. <laughs> Okay. One of my favorite things for NCAA's <laughs> is we have to leave at like 4:30, you'd like the last like the last day to go home and coming home at like 4 and I'm getting in and Bracky and CP are waking up. That happened this year. That was fun. Yeah, class. Last year. No, it, it didn't happen this year, no man. Yeah. 2019. Uh yeah. any other high school wrestlers yeah. besides Colot ever place at Midlands? Jason Welch did, I believe. Mhm. I don't know of many others. It's an exclusive really. list. Um, yeah. How yeah, you put out know. a trailer for Metcalf in May only to release an entire Penn State anthology before it and two months after it. That's a good uh, question. Building anticipation. Jay God. Listen, remember, do you remember the anticipation for, uh, for Terry? It's palpable. No, Metcalf is coming. Um... Oh, like, that's all you need to know. That's all. Yeah, that's all you need to know. August, September, in that range. Um, hey, um, you guys just Instagram. I just popped up my Instagram real quick. You guys just flow. Uh, retweeted one of my tweets yesterday, and that was that. Inst- uh, that DMX is one of the most underrated rappers of all time. Do you guys want to discuss that to end the show? You know, I listened to some rap. I would not classify him as underrated, but I don't know how he's really? actually. I don't know how he's actually rated. How is he rated? Well, well you know. I just feel like okay. Hold on. Making. Here's the thing about DMX. DMX is absolutely crazy now. It's dark and hell is hot. It's amazing. Um, he went through a lot. I don't. It, he is a hard one to properly rate because his career got submarined. What do you mean? Because he got he went to jail right for tax evasion. That, that and the, the Jesus thing, and there's a lot. He, he had a lot of twists and turns to his career. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I would probably say no, but I don't know. I'm not an authority on rap like um, like Andrew Spey. Have Andrew you seen Spey? Spey? He's, the, he's the foremost authority on rap. He is. At, I mean, he put out an authoritative top ten list that is irre- irrefutable in my mind. We, maybe we can read that on the next show. Um, but it's pretty good. All right, it's nine forty-four. We can get out one minute early. Um, good, we have, I got a piece so bad for for Ben Askren's bladder. Uh, for Dana Roy, I sacrificed for the for Wayne Bauman. <laughs> he did it for Wayne. Uh, thank you guys. Hey, seven o'clock Central, eight Eastern. We are episode three is dropping. So, Kyle Brack, you'll be back tomorrow. Yes. I will be on the road tomorrow to King of the Ring duels to watch actual live wrestling happen in front of my face. Wow. And uh, sanction PA. Sanction PA. Uh, thanks, Ben. Thanks, Dan. Thank you for listening. Really appreciate you guys. You're the best. See you tomorrow. Adios. <laughs>